All right. So I'm so excited. This is your favorite stylist. This is Melanie Day with You've Got Curls and Hair Loss Center and have a very special guest um, today. We have Ms. Dawn Runyon. Uh, she is the coordinator for Green Dot Lexington and located here in Lexington, Kentucky. She's also an um, inspirational speaker and life coach. And today's topic that we're going to be talking about is domestic violence, signs of abuse, and abusive relationships. So Dawn, I'm so happy to have you. How are you doing today? I'm great, Melanie. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited. Yes. So this is, um, you know, this is something that domestic violence is a really touchy issue, I think, for a lot of people. And it's it's kind of sensitive. So um, I wanted to kind of jump right into things, but tell us a little bit more about your background um, with Green Dot, Dawn's Light, and your services that you offer. Great. So I um, come from or come to this work uh, really just through my own personal life experiences. I was raised by a single teen mom, um, and we were experiencing domestic violence in the relationships that she was in. Um, I endured... Um, a number of years of childhood sexual abuse. And that led to, you know, as it would uh, me being a promiscuous teen and then getting involved in very unhealthy relationships, as well as even marrying into a relationship where domestic violence was occurring. Uh, and so I dealt with that for a number of years um, as an adult, just trying to, you know, not even recognizing that that's what I had actually gone through, just knowing that I had had these adverse experiences in life that had created a monster in me, in, in a sense, and not knowing myself and not loving myself. Uh, but through it all, there's always been a thread of working with young women and women of all ages, actually, and having them come and speak with me about their pains and th their hurts. And I really wanted to find a way to be able to connect with them, but also help them uh, just empower them to be able to move past those issues in their life because I felt like I had been blessed to be able to come through those things in my life and, and still pursue the type of life that I wanted for myself. So I came to the city of Lexington about three years ago because they were um, looking for someone to implement a domestic and sexual violence prevention program for the city, particularly mm -hmm. in the African-American community. And that program was Green Dot, which is a national evidence-based um, intervention program that really invites uh, the everyday person to reconsider their own personal role in how they can help to end domestic and sexual violence in our communities. And so that spoke to me because I came, I, I am 35 plus years past my domestic violence relationship, and I am here today because of a bystander, actually, uh, mm -hmm. someone who saw my situation, didn't think it was normal like I did, and made a choice to step in and choose safety for me, and that changed my life, uh, even though I didn't recognize it as greatly at that time. Uh, I can now see that she was instrumental, and she made a choice when I didn't know I had a choice to make for my own safety. And so Green Dot really resonated with me and I wanted to be able to have some kind of voice and have some action around how I could help other people who may be in the same experience uh, and situation that I was. So I, that's what I do with Green Dot, but also as Dawn's Light as a coach uh, and speaker, I'm always trying to speak truth to that. I think there's that 13 year old girl who exists in every last one of us who is mm -hmm. at the precipice, precipice of making probably one of the most monumental decisions in our life. Uh, for me, it was to engage in sexual activity or not, to give myself to the, the boys um, as a way to validate who I was as a person. That was the thought process that I had at that time. And I want to reach that, that young lady, but also the 50, 60, 70 year old woman who either made that sort of a choice or something different that has led them to make choices over the past 20, 30, 40 years that have kept them from living out their full potential. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I'm I'm happy that you had um someone that you didn't know step in, intercede for you. So I want to I want to talk about the importance of being a bystander because I think in today's culture now, um, a lot of us see things and it's just like, you know what, that's none of my business. I'm just gonna let it be. You know, I'm gonna keep my head down and keep it moving and pray that they're okay. 
But can you tell us more about Green Dot and if a person wants to be a bystander, like how does that work? Right. So thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Green Dot again, uh, national program. It actually started in the city of Lexington at the University of Kentucky, okay. like early 2000s. And now okay. it's national and even international. Yeah, Dr. Dorothy Edwards. It's, okay. Um, uh, she was studying, you know, violence intervention and prevention and domestic and sexual violence and, and came up with this great program. Um, and Again, it's it's all about it's kind of a grassroots way of, you know, just each individual person making a decision to allow that situation they see to be a part of their responsibility. Right. And and, and we're not asking everyone to take on the ultimate responsibility uh, because some people have different views and, and beliefs about what is and what isn't. But at the end of the day, recognizing that someone's safety may depend on us. And in that moment, just being a human, <laughs> being a good human, what is a choice that we can make to try and help that person be safe as well as ensure our own safety? So uh, the bystander approach with Green Dot is simple. We don't, it, it doesn't force you to do anything that you wouldn't normally do. It just uh, right. provides opportunity for you to think about how you could do something in that moment. I think most people walk away from situations, as you said, none of my business, I'm gonna keep my head down and keep it moving. But then you walk away and you're thinking, oh man, I hope they're okay. Mm -hmm. I should have done something. I don't, what was I gonna do though? You know, we, 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 we all have that kind of internal dialogue. I should have done something or I don't know, I didn't wanna get hurt. We call those barriers, right? Those are the things that come up when you see that alarming situation that mm -hmm. won't allow you to kind of step into that moment because you're thinking about your own personal safety first. Right. I don't want them retaliating on me. I don't want that anger directed towards me. Right. Uh, you're, you're thinking about uh, bringing shame and, uh, to your community. I don't want to step in. Oh, I know, I know Leroy, so I better not say anything because Leroy's connected my family, this and that, right? So we, the, all those barriers. Um, or what if I get it wrong? I don't know. Maybe they just playing. Maybe that's just how they do in their relationship. Right. I don't want to get in it. That's not my business, right? right? All of those things. And like myself, I think un the thing that undergirds all of that is that whole we don't we don't discuss our business in the street. I'm not airing my dirty laundry out here. I'm not telling nobody what goes on. And while there is a lot of protective measures in that idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a culture, we've had to develop ways to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's protective. Um, um, instances where we don't air our dirty laundry you know i think about growing up when we were living with different family members in order to survive fleeing from domestic violence and and just my young mother trying to finish school and trying to create a life for us well you know we was living up in an apartment where it was only two people on the lease but it was like five and six of us in that apartment we needed a place to stay so yeah. no i couldn't be out in the street talking about who all lives in the house Right. Because, you know, those systems that were in place just were not going to allow us to be able to thrive in that environment. But what I heard, what I understood from don't be telling our business was I couldn't tell anybody what was happening to me in a home when I started to experience childhood sexual abuse. No one told me I couldn't talk about that. But that umbrella of we don't talk about our business, we don't tell nobody what goes on in this house silenced me. And so there are a lot of people that are living in that silence now. So Green Dot kind of addresses that. It helps recognize that barrier. Uh, it helps us to identify what are the signs? What might we see that would let us know that someone might be in harm's way of either a domestic violence, dating violence, even child abuse or, or sexual violence. So we, we, we spend time in our trainings discussing what those signs are, what to look for. Um, and people develop those answers themselves. Green Dot doesn't tell you what those answers are. It helps you to think and brainstorm like, you know what, this would make me feel uncomfortable. If I saw this situation, I would probably think something's going on. Right. And so once you recognize that, what we call a red dot, that yeah. harmful behavior is a red dot. Um, then we give you ways of how to respond. A green dot, what is an equal and opposite reaction to what you're seeing? A green dot, uh, a very simple, small thing, nothing over the top. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not saying to confront someone that is irate and angry 
with that same energy, <laughs> we're saying right. we tools we call the three D's direct delegate or distract. And we teach you kind of what, what it looks like to do something direct. What does it look like to delegate? Who do you delegate to helping people to brainstorm and think about who are people, safe people in our community that we could delegate to, to bring into this situation who might be better equipped to address it to address the problem. Maybe, you know, we know Big Lou, Big Lou live down the street. Everybody listen to Big Lou. If Big Lou right. say, brother, you don't talk to your woman like that, they're going to listen to Big Lou. So let me right. get Big Lou involved, right? right? Or, you know, let me talk with my minister at church. Maybe we need to have some conversations on domestic violence in the church because it's happening, but no one's talking about it. And if the minister starts talking about it, then people will know it's safe that they can talk about it too. Right. So delegate and then distract could be as simple as, you know, anything, um, pretending like you, um, you found something that belongs to somebody in a parking lot. Oh my God. Did you just drop this? I'm so sorry. I think it fell out your bag. I'm sorry. Just to interrupt the conversation sure. uh, argument that might be going on to give people in that moment space mm -hmm. and time to either calm down or to realize like, oh, wait a minute, I'm up here acting crazy in the middle of the parking lot. Let me get myself together. Or mm -hmm. possibly to give an intended victim an opportunity to get away, to ask for help, or to at least leave a situation where they were being targeted in that moment. So uh, I love Green Dot because it has um, implication for any type of situation, right? Mm -hmm. You can use those kind of tools in any kind of uh, confrontational situation. Uh, but they are also very simple tools and ways to intervene in a moment of domestic and sexual violence right in our community, right in our home. Kids can do it. Adults can do it. Anybody can do it. Right. It just gives people the permission to do so. That's good. So I wanted to pivot um, or not pivot, not pivot, but piggyback off what you were saying earlier as far as the signs of abuse. Because a lot of people may not know, or they might be like, you know what, that's no big deal. Um, a person kind of like cut me down is no big deal. That that's just that's just them. Or a person being like um, always checking up on me, like they really love me. No. So, what are some signs of abuse that you can share with the audience with us? Well, it's great that you you, you know approached it in that way, right? That idea of, oh, that's just how they are. That person, that's just them. Mm -hmm. um, we have normalized some extremely toxic behaviors um, in our dating relationships, even in our friendships. It can be girlfriend to girlfriend. And I got a girlfriend who has always cut me down, but I'm like, that's just her. Mm -hmm. But I'm stressed when I'm around her. I mm -hmm. like, I have an issue, like, that's not healthy, right? And so we take those type of relationships and then we use the same measure in our dating relationships and our marriages that we uh, pursue. So I think it's important uh, for us just um, to understand how much of the things that we've taken in either through media, uh, through, you know, unfortunate, um, poor or ignorant, and I hate to use that word, I don't want it to sound as negative as I mean, but you understand ignorance, just not knowing, right? Um, not having the kind of instruction that we needed growing up to, to know what's healthy and what's unhealthy in our relationships. So the thing with domestic, especially domestic and dating violence, when, it talk, when, when we're talking about the signs, what is so unfortunate is oftentimes the signs of an unhealthy relationship mimic the signs of a healthy relationship. It's just mm. about timing and consistency. Um, domestic and sexual violence are patterns of behavior. They're not one-offs. Um, they're not situations where um, someone's putting you down, they cut you down, and you're able to say to them, hey, you know, when you say A and B, that makes me feel this way. And that person is, is recognizes and realizes and goes, oh, you know, I hadn't even thought about it like that. I, I've always said that kind of stuff. I never thought about it. I appreciate mm -hmm. you telling me that. That's not going to happen again. And you move on and, mm -hmm. and it doesn't come back up. But it's when you say to someone, hey, you know, when you say this to me, it makes me feel this way. And their thing is, oh, you being sensitive. Like, mm -hmm. that's not even what I meant. Like, you just, you blowing stuff out of proportion and they just move past it. They don't validate that. And then those types of conversations continue to happen. So it's that pattern 
um, that someone uses to exhibit control over you. That's, I mean, that's the whole issue with domestic and dating violence. What are they saying and doing and why are they saying it and doing it? If they are using behaviors, if they're using conversations, if they're using their words or finances or um, emotional manipulation in order to keep you in a relationship Mm -hmm. or prevent you from having other relationships, if they're using it in a way to make you dependent upon them or using it so that you um, see them in a better light and feel that you you owe them something, that's coercion, that's abusive, that's control. And that's what's really going on. So um, for instance, um, I always tell people I've been married like 28 years now. And so in, in my congratulations, <laughs> thank you. Cause you know, we're, you know. We're not, we are not going to let that just slide by that's, that's a big deal. Congratulations to both of you. It is. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a second marriage. So like, woo, you know, um, when I was young and didn't, like my mom said, young, dumb, and didn't know none. <laughs> that was her old slogan. Uh, when I was in that part, I was in a relationship that wasn't healthy. Uh, in this marriage, we made decisions together. You know what? We're not going to spend a certain amount of money without talking to the other person. That's healthy. So if I'm hanging out with my girlfriends, especially in the early days, my girlfriend's like, ooh, let's go out. We're going to go to this place. Let's buy this outfit. Let's get this purse. And let's, you know, let's go to Vegas for the weekend. Mm-hmm. Well, I couldn't just be like, oh, yeah, good. Let's go. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, ooh, I, I like that. Let me talk to my man, see what I can do. You know, I can right. let him know. So I'm like, honey, boom, boom, boom. This is coming on. I'd like to go. And we would make a decision together. Mm-hmm. That's healthy. That's, That's not a problem. Yeah. That's respect. Yep. However, on the flip side, when I'm in an a, unhealthy relationship, that conversation may sound very different. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I don't give all the background. It's just never like, Dawn can't ever pay for her lunch. Dawn can't ever hang out with the girls. Like, what's the issue? Anytime mm-hmm. we say, let's do this or that, she's like, mm, yeah, I don't know about that. That that probably wouldn't work. I don't know if he, you know, he might not want me to do that or mm. I don't know, you know, I can't really afford that. It's okay if you can't afford it, but like she can't ever afford it. What's going on? Like that's a pattern. What's going on? So we just kind of key in into the tone, mm-hmm. um, the the reason someone gives. They're like, oh girl, your man don't never let you go nowhere. Mm-hmm. Oh, he just love me. He don't want me to be <laughs> out here by myself like that. You know what I'm saying? He just likes to spend time with me. Right. Yeah. Okay. But you are your own person too. Right. So it should be okay for you to spend time. But when we're, when we're thinking that that attention that that other person is giving us is coming from a place of love, we believe like he just want all my time. He just like to spend time with me. And you mm-hmm. see that right in a healthy relationship in the very beginning, mm-hmm. they always together like, Hey girl, you can mm-hmm. go nowhere. Y'all yep. together all the time. Let each other breathe. Mm-hmm. And I remember people saying that to me, even my husband, my current husband in our early days, like y'all always together. And I'm like, yes, we like each other. We want to be yeah. together. But we like each other. <laughs> we like each other. <laughs> but it can cross, right? It can cross mm-hmm. a boundary. It can cross into a space where it's unhealthy because now I can't, you know, maybe I don't, I can't go anywhere by myself. Uh, or even when I don't want him to be there, he shows up or mm-hmm. um, I'm out with my girlfriends and next thing I know, here he is at the bar. I'm like, oh, how'd you even know I was at the bar? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somehow he knows. And he asked to, you know, he asks questions all the time. So these are, I mean, what's healthy, what's unhealthy. Sometimes they're very clear. And then at other times they're not, they can cross over. Uh, I think what is important to recognize is how is the um, the person with less power, I would say that, the person with less power in that relationship, how do they feel about those, those instances? Um, if they feel talked down to, and maybe, again, not recognizing it because they grew up being talked down to all right. the time. But if as a friend, we can say, like, wow, like, 
he always says that about you and you're not lazy. Why is he always talking about you lazy? Because you didn't do uh-huh. so-and-so. You got three kids. Uh-huh. You're tired, <laughs> but you're not lazy. We right. have that conversation and then it gives that person the opportunity to think, well, you know, he just say that because I don't ever do, you know, we do, are they making excuses about what this person is saying about them or to them? Right. Um, I think we also usually when someone talks about the violence, we see the physical. And that, that's what we focus on. We focus on the physical. You being a, a hairdresser, working with clients, sitting in your chair, you are definitely positioned to see. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So you might see the bruises. You might see the wounds. You might notice the person that's talking about neck strain or, you know, sore muscles, like what's going on? And they're just, I don't know, then, you know, they may not, they may make an excuse about it or whatever, but the physical, we can, we can generally see and we will make a determination based on that. But mm-hmm. domestic violence goes so much further and it's even worse the less you see, if that makes sense. Right? The psychological. 100%, the psychological. Yeah. The mind games, we, we have the term gaslighting, you know, it's been yeah. around since what, like 1943, I think, but we're using it a lot more now and just coming to understanding of how, how impactful that is. Mm -hmm. Um, to be in a relationship with someone that at the end of the day, you're questioning what you know to be true. You question your own ideas. You question your own. Can we talk about that? Because I think that that's something just in my realm as being behind the chair over the years, from 17 years, I've seen conversations that I've had with, with, with women or just observation, um, so I guess my question is, is that you see a person that's that's in a situation or you may know of a situation or they may tell you things, but then when you confront the, the I don't want to say confront, but when you ask the friend or the victim about certain things, the script changes and then they defend, they defend, you know, the abuser. So can you explain like why that happens? And even though like you have all, like all these things, these receipts of everything, like, can you explain like why that happens? You know, I, it, it probably is above my pay grade. Right. But for, just on a, on a core level. So I don't know if you're familiar and your, your listeners and your viewers are familiar with a power and control wheel. Um, mm-hmm. That is a tool that's used to kind of explain how, domestic violence, sexual violence continues, how it works. Um, Basically, you have this wheel with an inner wheel. Um, On the outside wheel is what we see. It's the physical violence, the the physical abuses that a person uses to to maintain control over someone. And in the center of that wheel are um, the different tools, the different um, spokes that they use to keep the wheel spinning. And that's where you get into the psychological, the emotional, the financial. Um, It's almost, you know, a Stockholm syndrome or such Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. it's a person, you know, a certain amount of pressure applied over a course of time can create a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about um, ideas, terminology, um, responses applied consistently over time to someone, it slowly convinces a person of a different idea, a different Mm -hmm. idea than what either they were brought up to believe, or maybe it reinforces an idea that they saw played out in their family, right? Domestic and sexual violence, any type of violence, this stuff is generational. Like we've been dealing with this since day one. Mm -hmm. Um, And in in the Black community, we've been dealing with all of the the external violences, violations to us that that, um, undergird and and help us to normalize domestic and sexual violence. You know, when, when sexual violence is forced upon you in slavery and it continues throughout the rest of your life, well, when your husband starts to apply that same pressure, well, okay, that's that's always been. That's what happens. Mm-hmm. So the psychological side of domestic violence is just that. Women or men, and I want to be clear, domestic and sexual violence can happen to anyone. 
mm-hmm. by anyone. It is not just a women's issue. It truly is a man's issue because it it's men needing to stand up and say, you know what, this isn't appropriate. This isn't right for me or you to treat someone this way. So it's, it's their issue too. But it's also an issue where men um, and people in same sex, heterosexual, whatever, it happens to us all. So I want to be clear that we don't just focus on the fact that it's a man to woman, but it's about power and control. So regardless of the relationship, there is someone in that relationship who has more influence or more, um, again, just a control in the situation. Maybe they are the primary breadwinner. Or if you're in a relationship with someone who your livelihood kind of depends on their financial prowess and they continue to remind you, they continue to prove to you over and over again that you are not either of value or you have nothing outside of what they provide for you, Mm -hmm. then you fall into this situation where psychologically you're not able to see your way to something different. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in domestic violence relationships, you might see oftentimes where it starts out where, and I will just use men and women, because of course that's our, you know, where we kind of come from Mm -hmm. seeing it happen a lot easier where you see a man who he employs all these gifts. He he's providing for basic necessities early in the relationship. You know, the woman's like, wow, you know, we have a, we are inherently designed to want provision right? The the female in the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, it's the same thing. The women need that provider and the male wants a woman who can create a family. So those are just genetic things that we're kind of in tune to. So when you start dating someone and they're providing, you know, they, they, oh, you don't have to spend your money. I got you. Let me get that for you. You know, you're Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, he's taking care of everything. That's so sweet. I've been out here working hard. I finally got somebody that can help me out. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's healthy. That's fine. But over time, it becomes they, they they slowly start to pull away any independence that you may have. It may be, you know what, you don't even have to worry. Let me take care of you. I got you. You don't mm-hmm. even have to work. Why that job stressing you out like that? Let me help you take care of that. You don't have to work that job. And it's it's speaking to that internal, you know, motivation. It's speaking into that that internal need that we have to be cared for. And so it's slow and it's steady and it is a consistent pattern of behavior that's being applied. And eventually the woman starts to allow control of her day-to-day to to go to someone else. Mm. And once that person has established that kind of control in their life, if they are a person who is going to choose abuse, because we need to recognize that as well, when you're in a relationship with someone that's violent, they're choosing abuse. They're choosing to control. It's not something that just happens. And I don't know how that happened. And, and we just got into a fight and I just lost control. No, that person is choosing to control and more than likely have that in mind from day one mm-hmm. um, for their own self-gratification. They're not some evil. I don't believe that they're this, oh, I'm going to control this person. But it's more like, I validate myself by being in control and I'm going to control the things that I do and the people around me and whatever else mentality that that person may have. And so after you have relinquished enough of who you are as a person, you now feel dependent. You now feel that uh, I, this person is taking care of me. So how can I refute what they say? Mm-hmm. And just about any anything that they suggest or anything that they um, request from you You now feel kind of obligated to give into. You feel that um, they've taken, you know, your own sense of, again, independence. And so it's like, well, what else do I do? It it, it is a slow, steady amount of pressure and, and influence that's applied in a person's life that leads someone to a place where they're in a relationship with an abuser and they don't see a way out of that situation. Wow. That, that's, that's heavy. That's, that's a lot. I'm processing. I'll have to re-listen to our conversation to process everything that you just said, but that is, that's very deep. Um, you know, especially a lot of things, uh, you know, like they talk about um, trauma bonding or 
you know, trauma DNA that that's passed on generational uh, things. And one thing that gives me comfort is knowing, you know, like how we are created, you know, we're created in God's image and that he wants nothing but good things for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but also too, that whatever has caused us pain in our past, or whatever that um, is inherently passed down, you know, through our genes, he promises to get rid of that. He says, you know, it won't come up, it won't even be mentioned in your memory again. And I find that fascinating because when you think about science, you know, we're we're a new person almost every 90 days, right? You know, we have new blood that's going through our body. Our cells are constantly being rejuvenated. So to me, that's uh, an affirmation that of what he says is a reality. Yes. You know, that's the reality as far as like the pain that I was caused in the past, that would not, that's not going to come up in my future because God says so. So what you just said, it made me, it made me think of that. But at the same time, um, you know, we live in a here and now. So what can I do? What can friends and family do if they see someone struggling, knowing that they're in a situation and they've, You've seen things, they, the victim themselves have told you things, but they keep going back and forth, back and forth. Like what can be done? What kind of support can you provide it? Right. Great question. And I think that's the, that's the hang up that that's the part that gets everybody like, but mm -hmm. she keeps going back. I mean, I don't know, you know, sometimes we just get fed up. Like I'm tired of telling her to leave because she just keeps going back. Mm -hmm. what we want to help people recognize and understand is it's not that simple right and the survivor is the subject matter expert in that situation they know how to survive mm -hmm. and although they may tell you things that are going on in that relationship they're probably giving you the tip of the iceberg as to what really is going on in that relationship and they know or feel very strongly that if they leave worse will happen. The abusers probably already told them that, has already convinced them of it or proven it. Um, generally, people who leave domestic violence relationships have attempted to leave at least seven times before they actually finally get away. Wow. Um, and those times before they got pulled back in for various reasons. Are there children involved? Mm -hmm. Is that person the the primary breadwinner? Does that that does the victim now have a have a way to take care of themselves? There's so many. Um, you know, I think we were at a conference recently. We we're talking about you know most people are very familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of basic needs, right? If a person's basic needs don't exist, it is extremely difficult to leave a, a relationship where those basic needs are being met, even though there's abuse associated with it. It's no different than drug trying to leave drug addiction, trying to leave uh, sex trafficking or sex work, trying to leave a job. I mean, job. You know, some people are in jobs that are hostile. And you're like, why do you still work there after 25 years? Because it is providing the basic needs. And that's what a person needs in order to thrive and survive. So when you're talking with your loved one about leaving the relationship, there's so many factors that are behind why that person stays. And oftentimes the biggest one is just that they love the person. Yes. They love the abuser. They don't love the abuse. They do not want the abuse to continue. If you can convince my husband to stop hitting me, we will be great, right? That is what they're thinking. And that's what they want and desire more than anything. So man, we can't fault and we can't, we can't hate a person for loving someone, even when that person mistreats them because domestic violence doesn't happen all day long. Now, mm -hmm. the, the heaviness of it, the idea of it is always there. Mm -hmm. But there's always those periods where he's so sweet and he's so loving. Oh my gosh. And we get along so well. And he's a great provider to my kids. And we see those things and we try to separate it from the fact that he's abusing me and you fear him for your life and your kids are aware of it. They see it. And sometimes we don't recognize that we think he's not abusing the kids. So everything's good. Mm -hmm. But your children are seeing, they understand, they know what's happening long term. So we got to, you know, we got to try to address that too. But there's just so many things. But as a family member, the best way we can help someone who is dealing with a domestic 
or who is living in a domestic violent home or home where that is occurring is by supporting and loving them, being by their side, not giving up on them, always letting them know that you are a safe space and that you will be willing to assist however you can if and when that person is ready to make the decision to leave. Because if we don't feel like we have somewhere safe to go, we won't leave. Why am I going to, you know, the devil I know <laughs> is better than the one I don't know. Mm-hmm. When that person stepped into my life 35 plus years ago, she involved my mother and my mother reached out to me and I had been ashamed to tell my mother what was going on because I didn't want to hear, I told you so, yeah, you shouldn't have left. I tried to tell you, you know, all the things that I thought I would hear. My mother said, why in the world would you think after I went through all that domestic violence in my life, why do you think I would stand by and allow you to go through the same thing? And mm-hmm. I was just like, wow, you know, I, I, I thought this is just what we do. And you'd have been like, either it's your fault or you just got to stick it out. That's what I thought the response would be. But she helped me get away from that situation. Um, if I didn't feel like she was going to be a safe space for me to go to, I would have stayed because Mm -hmm. at least I had food and shelter. At least I had a label. That was something I was seeking. I wanted to belong to somebody. Mm -hmm. He made me his wife. I I finally belonged, right? I had all these hurts and pains coming to that point. So there's just, there's just so much underlying it, but as a family member supporting And loving that person through it is the best thing. You can't force them to leave. You can't say things like, you know, disparaging their partner isn't going to help because basically you're applying coercion and control just like the abuser is now. So we can't, you're not going to offset domestic violence by authority, you know, or asserting your authority or, or trying to control the outcome. You've got to show them the opposite way. And that's through love and support and encouragement, trying to provide resources, helping them create a plan to be able to leave when they feel safe, Mm -hmm. Um, getting in contact with agencies that support survivors that can help them develop a plan, maybe applying, you know, that subtle um, and consistent um, reminder that if there's another way, let's find it. There, there, there's something else we can do. You deserve better. You don't, you know, you don't deserve this treatment regardless of what you've done, because I think a lot of survivors do or victims feel like they are bringing it on themselves. Um, there's a reason it's happening to them. They've made a wrong choice or they've made mistakes in their past yeah. or they are not capable enough or adequate enough. And, and all of those are lies that we learn through that abusive relationship or learn from that abuser. Um, and as a supporter, we've just got to help give a different message to them. I love that. I love that. So, you know, me, I always like to end on a high, you know, a high level, high point. So support and love is what's needed and creating a safe space. So Dawn, thank you so much. Like I'm, I'm tearing up. I don't know if you're tearing up, but I'm, I'm a little teary eyed right now. Cause you know, it was, it's, it's personal. I think for a lot of us, um, we all have, you know, family and friends, or even perhaps ourselves that are maybe going through a situation. And so just hearing, um, these, um, tips that are reaffirming different things that it's like it's not us you know it's it's not you it's not me um it's you know it's the other person and what can we as friends and family do but be supportive love and be a safe space so as far as safe spaces um where are some places that you know of that are safe spaces that a person can go to when they feel like they need a place to go Sure. So right here in Lexington specifically, there is Greenhouse 17, which you mentioned, which is our domestic and sexual violence um, agency that provides shelter um, for those that are are seeking that shelter, even if it's just temporary, even if it's just a couple of nights away in order to make a plan for the next phase, right? I think people feel like I got to move out and that's it and never walk back. But maybe you just need a moment 
so you can develop the plan for later. So uh, Greenhouse 17 is great. There's the Amanda Center, which is run by uh, Kathy Sheriff Witt's office. So the Sheriff office has Amanda Center. The, both of those places have amazing advocates uh, and uh, helpline um, individuals that can, you know, that are available 24 seven. So you can make the phone call and I don't have the number. Don't ask me, I can get it That's to okay. you and I'm sure you'll provide it. Yeah. Um, but we can, you can get that assistance 24 seven. The Nest is another great place for women and families. Uh, they have everything from daycare even to, to assist people who might be experiencing uh, those situations. And they are just safe uh, people to be able to connect with. And then um, my office with the Lexington uh, City Government, uh, the Domestic and Sexual Violence Prevention Coalition, uh, we can connect you with other resources. We have online tools uh, with tons of resources. Even my Green Dot program, I give out cards that have various organizations on the backside that are supports and resources. I'm working to try and create um, some more safe spaces within church communities. And many of them, you know, already have those communities. But I think if people are looking, it's, it would serve them well to be a part of a church where they feel like and ask that question, whether they're a victim or know of someone else. Just like, you know, hey, pastor, how would we address it if someone's dealing with that and find out what kind of space is available for them in the church uh, mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally and what kind of resources that they can provide to individuals in their community. And then there are a wealth of women and men throughout the city who are um, really strong advocates uh, for ending domestic and sexual violence in our communities. And so I think as we are making connections with individuals, looking for those new friendships, hey, the, the great thing about social media is people got their life out there for you to see Right. See what they're talking about. Who are they? I'm like, I want to make friends with people who believe that way, who who have healthy ideals on relationship. And uh, I say that it's even for our youth as they're making, you know, they want everybody to be friends. Well, who are you? Who's your friend group? <laughs> mm -hmm. Do they agree or disagree with the type of lifestyle or the type of um, relationship that you may be a part of? find those supportive people about, around you and then reach out to the resources that are available. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. This was much needed. And I'm sure um, this is not going to be our, our last conversation because we're going we're, we're going to get back together. I can I can I can feel it. We're going to get back together for sure. For awesome. Sure. There's so much more, right? So thank yes. you for even yes. providing this space with what you do. You are so well uh, position to assist and help so many people. So thank you. You know, people will say, what does a hairstylist have to do with this? And you are so positioned uh, in the best way to be able to help and support. That's one of my goals is to have um, salons and barbers in the city be Green Dot supporters uh, mm -hmm. because they will have those conversations uh, firsthand and they can create a culture in their own establishment that will not allow for these crazy rates to violence to occur. So thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. So there you have it, everyone. Um, like I said, this was a, a, a sensitive topic, but a much needed conversation uh, talking about domestic violence, signs of abuse and abusive relationships. So Dawn, thank you so much. For those of you all that are listening um, in the show notes, I will have the resources posted that if you're local, um, you could check them out. Even if you're not local, there are national networks that you can tap into that you can text um, on your phone or you can go on your device, whichever, anonymously. Um, there's a lot of resources that are out there. And as always, this is a benefit as being a part of our In Living Curls Hair Care community. We are sharing and providing credible information and resources um, so that you can share with your friends and family. And and also be an advocate for those that may not have a voice, be an advocate for the voiceless. So once again, Dawn, thank you. Have a beautiful day and we will connect soon. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you so much.